think we're down here. All right. Is it? Which one are you? Am I here? Fantastic. Well, this is a first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, thank you very much indeed for, for, for coming. I'm really, really grateful. Um, thank you so much for, for, for the speech. Uh, before we get on to the substance, how, how are you enjoying Prime Minister's questions? <laughs> I'm a bit out of practice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we well, he's not turning him. up. I haven't seen him for three weeks. Um, we got one tomorrow, and then I think only two more before conference. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm um, more than anyone else. Yeah, that's something I really don't miss, you know. Yeah. I, I, no, even now, whenever I, wherever I am in the world, sort of midday Wednesday, I think, <laughs> I've got this uneasy feeling. I know that's what it was. But I think at least you moved it from twice a week into once a week. Yep. So that's only on a Wednesday at 12. It's a small number of people who should be grateful to me, but they should be very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep reminding the Shadow Cabinet that back in the day, the Prime Minister used to sit on the front bench and choose which of his ministers would answer the question. Right. Yes. So we could go back to that model. <laughs> yeah, we never know what they're going to say, though. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so... Um, you know, you've done an amazing job. You've taken the Labour Party in 2019. It was on the brink of extinction, frankly. Uh, and you've taken it. I know you can't say it's on the brink of government, but I think it's a, it's a pretty good prospect. And yet, I think we both agree that 1997 is very different from 2024. You know, in 1997, we had a, a lot of things to do, but on the other hand, we could see that growth had stabilized, and we, we could look forward to over 2% trend growth. What you're going to inherit next year is, I mean, as I said earlier, it's, uh, it's grim, right? Yeah, it's going to be really tough. But I think this point about the mood of the country is really, really important, because now we've got to a position where we're a credible contender, and that's all we are. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, people are looking back to when this last happened. And we've only, I mean, as you know better than anyone, we've only won from opposition three times. And obviously, 97 was the last time. And the mood then was one of growing optimism. That song, Things Can Only Get Better, that resonated because it felt that was the mood of the country at the time. The economy was growing, and you know, what Labour was able to come in and, and absolutely sort of turbocharge that sense that we're going to go into a new century. It's a new way of doing politics, modernising. Things can only get better. That's not the position now, by a long shot. The economy is badly damaged. Public services are, I say, on their knees. My wife, who works for the NHS, would say, on their face. Um, and the mood of the country, I think, is pretty bleak. And I think many people fall into two camps. The camp that says to me, I like what you're saying, your missions, the change that I think you would bring about, but can you do it? Can you do it? It seems too broken to me. And then another group that say, uh, will you do it? We've been lied to so much in the last 13 years, we don't actually believe anything anybody says. So the mood is very different. The reason it matters, I mean, it's not just a sort of historic, interesting analysis, we have to get the mood of the country right because we have to speak to the country where it is now and not where we'd like it to be. And therefore, it's a mistake to us to speak to the country as if it's 1996. We've got to speak to the country as it is in 2023. Right, and they want a sense of realism. Yeah. Reassurance. They want hope, of course, but the reassurance has to come first. Do you get it? Do you know how bad things are? Do you know how much I'm struggling? Can you fix the immediate problem? And can you deal with the longer-term fundamentals yeah. that we need to fix? I mean, I think, I mean, I'm personally a fan of the, of the five missions because here's what I think they, they, they do, which I think is really important in this context. I mean, if you uh, take over from Rishi Sunak next year, you will be the sixth prime minister in eight years. And in the previous uh, 37 I, or 36, I think we had um, 
five. So, but not only have we many prime ministers, but they've all been very different from each other, right? So, David Cameron, Theresa May was very different from David Cameron. Uh, Boris Johnson was very different from Theresa May. Um, so, there was, Sunak was... There was, there was one in the middle there. <laughs> Trust. Oh, yeah. Well, that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Easy to a, overlook. Yeah, well, she was very different. Um, <laughs> so, so you, you... Yeah. So the thing is, what that does, I think this is really important, because what that does is it means you cannot have a consistent government policy, right? Yeah. So I think what is really important to me about these missions is that they set clarity of direction. That's, it's so important that we have mission-driven government for all those reasons. I think the single biggest failure of the last 13 years is failure to grow the economy. If we'd grown the economy in the last 13 years, as well as you grew it in the 13 years before that under the Labour government, we'd have tens of billions of pounds to spend on public services without altering tax at all. One of the reasons we haven't grown it is all that chopping and changing. And when we say we've had three prime ministers in the last year, and four chancellors and four budgets. That is politically funny. It makes for really good cartoons. It's a disaster when it comes to investment and strategic thinking. And so part of the task we will inherit is bringing stability to government and ensuring that our projects are clear, they're focused, they're realistic, and that we stick to it over the long term and don't move around and chop and change. I've spoken, you, you know, we were at Davos together, we spoke to no end of investors who say to me, it's not that we don't have the money to invest in some of the projects in Britain that need investment, it's that we don't see the conditions of certainty right at the moment that will allow us to come alongside a government and actually deliver. And that's why the missions are strategic, long-term, they're about the what change you're going to make, growing the economy, NHS for the future, green power, you know, smashing the class ceiling, and security in our communities, but also the how. How are you going to do this? How are you going to get business to partner alongside you and deliver on these missions? And that's why we're having a row at the moment about tough choices, yep. because we need to cr the, the stability in our economy is absolutely vital as a stepping stone to getting onto those missions. So when people say, look, you should be making all these spending commitments and... Well, uh, my first reaction, you know, we keep saying collectively as a party, we've got to take tough decisions. And in the abstract, everyone says, that's right, Keir. <laughs> and then we get a tough decision. We've been in one of those for the last few days. They well, don't like that. Can we just not make that one? Um, I'm sure there's another tough decision somewhere else that we could make. Um, but we have to take the tough decisions. And this isn't, you know, this isn't some sort of reflection on some focus group that says, you know, we'd like Labour to um, have an economic straitjacket on. It's the fundamentals. Liz Truss was very different. Um, to others, she proved the thesis that if you make unfunded uh, commitments, uh, then the economy um, is damaged and working people pay the price. Right, that could be and tax that, or spending, right? That could be tax. For her, it was unfunded uh, tax cuts, but it could be unfunded spending. So if you want proof that um, unfunded commitments cause economic damage, which is then you know, visited on working people, you've got a living example of that. And that, that can come from both sides of politics, and so it's a fundamental. I will not let the next Labour government um, get anywhere near the equivalent of what Liz Truss is. Because it, it, it will... <laughs> but it is also, for that invest... We need um, to partner with business to get these missions done, because they're massive. They'll make a big difference to our country if we can do it. That means we have to show um, that the conditions of certainty are there, sufficient for them to put in their lot and come alongside us. So it's not a, this idea that you can either have you know, responsible economy or big reform is completely wrong. The only way you get the big reform is by having a secure economy. And that's, a fun, and that's um, you know, the discussion that we're having internally in the Labour Party now. I'm absolutely clear about the direction of travel on this. I mean, I think the other thing that's interesting is that, you know, some of the... So, so, so people always say, yeah, but how, how are you going to do these things? But, for example, in the speech you've just given now, you, 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 you mentioned planning specifically. Yep. And one of the things we've explored today at this conference 
is in relation, for example, to the clean energy revolution, just how, how planning is holding us back, right? Yeah, completely. And um, I spoke to the CEO of one of our big energy companies um, not long ago, and I said, look, just assuming for a moment that we are able to come into power, and I want to get to clean um, electricity, clean power by 2030, how quickly could you build me um, an onshore wind farm? And he said, two years. Thought, wow, we're, we're, we're going to be really motoring here. So I said, well, how soon do I get power out of it? He said, oh, that'll be 13 years. I said, well, talk me through that then. He said, I'm going to lose five years to planning. And then even when I've done that, I said, well, we're still losing six years here. Where does that come from? He said, even when we've done the planning, we've got through that, then the grid will not start crawling towards me until I'm ready to switch the power on. So 13 years. We can't win the race for the next generation of jobs with that. So we're going to have to be really bold on planning um, and remove those impediments. And, th and this is what I mean by mission-driven government, which is if you get elected into government with five missions, then you are democratically entitled to say that's the direction of travel for our country because we've put it to the country and they said we want these fundamental changes. We've then got a choice as to how to do it. We could say, well, they're our mission, so we'll suck it all up to the centre and run it through government, which will be a big mistake. Or we can say, well, the missions are clear, so the private sector normally follows and the market's pretty good, so let them get on with it. That won't work. Or we can partner where we say, um, this is what we're trying to achieve. You are vested in helping us achieve this, and our job is to make sure the conditions are such that you can uh, ensure that happens. So for those onshore wind farms, the job of an incoming Labour government is to say, we're going to deal with planning laws, we're going to deal with all of the problems in infrastructure that are holding this back, and through this partnership, deliver, um, in this case, an onshore wind farm, but there are plenty of other examples, um, and actually get ahead. Of, and that, that, of course, I mean, onshore wind is not just about the climate obligations. It is the single, quick, um, well, clean energy is the single best way to keep our bills down, um, to ensure that we have energy security so Putin can't put his boots on our throat, and the next generation of jobs are bound up with this. The Inflation Reduction Act in America is like a magnet for investment at the moment. The EU has responded, and this government's sitting it out. We've got to turn that around. I mean, one of the things, obviously, is, is in relation to the partnership between public and private sector. I mean, I know you spend a lot of time talking to, to business and to the business community. Have you got from, from, from them, is, is, there a, is there a set of things that they're looking to from government that you can identify? Yeah. The first is stability economic stability, because they say we're not coming near this until you're... The first thing is stability. The second is a long-term strategy. The missions are intended to be long-term. Um, just another... I mean, this is another wind farm example, but it, it serves the purpose. Whiteley is the biggest onshore wind farm in the UK. It's just outside Glasgow. There's 350 wind turbines there. It's amazing to go and see it. It's like a film set. It's incredible. Uh, on the side of the hill there. Um, and when I went there with the CEO of Scottish Power, I looked at them, they're big, incredible pieces of manufacturing. I said, how many of these were built in the UK then? And he said, none of them. I said, well, why not? He said, because we didn't have a long-term strategy. The government wasn't clear enough, back to your point about chopping through six different prime ministers, and therefore the investors went elsewhere. These were all made in Indonesia, he said. And they were to towed in, literally towed in to Scotland and erected there. And so business is saying security, clear strategic goals and you're going to stay the course and they've got to be the right goals. I, mean, I think this is one big difference from when we were in because in a way you know that we, we had a, a situation where growth was strong, the economy was running reasonably well. Um, I mean obviously there were changes that, uh, that Gordon and myself made that were important but I think there's a much greater priority now as we enter a new, in, new age industrially for that partnership between public and private sector? Yeah. I, I think it's the only way we can deliver. If you look at um, the money that's needed to invest in clean power, you can't do it all through state funding. That's never going to get us there on time. So we need that partnership. Um, but we need to create the conditions in which that partnership works. Right. So health, obviously, is a big... Uh, Big priority for the, the Labour yeah. Party always is. You've talked about reform, Kia, and what we talked today a lot about what's 
possible with a lot of the, the, the you know, new technology and, and the ability to create new treatments, um, to do better diagnostics, prevention, and, and cure. How, how, how much does that fit into the, the plan of what you need to do with the health service? It's central. It's absolutely central, the technology and the changes. If you take AI, I mean, you may have had this example today, but a radiologist working with AI can um, get a 60% more accurate diagnostics on stage one cancer, lung cancer, than we can without. Um, and that is obviously very good news for the individual, but massively um, important for the NHS because it costs, if you don't catch it, I mean, we all know this, if you don't catch cancer till stage four, um, then you're looking at a much poorer outcome for the individual and um, a much bigger bill for the NHS. So it's absolutely central. But this goes, on the mission on the NHS, we had to be clear, we don't just want to pick the NHS up and put it back on its feet. Of course we want to do that. But I don't want five years of Labour government where all we've achieved is managing slightly better the services and institutions as they now are. I want them to be materially better. And the, you know, whatever the mistakes the last 13 years have been many, the challenges facing the NHS are just fundamentally different now um, to the challenges it faced 75 years ago. And the techniques for dealing with it, the, the technology has gone yeah, and the so fast, right. the AI. So that means we have the opportunity, if we take it, to create an NHS fit for the future, which is technology, it's about prevention, moving health closer to our communities. At the moment, we've got go to the GP or go to A&E as broadly the only options, and you need something close to the communities. Mental health needs to be catered for. So we're talking about a model that will survive for generations to come, not just a slightly better health service at the end of five or more years of a Labour government. Right, and then obviously if you want to make use of the technology, you've got to build the right digital infrastructure and so on and so forth. That is also really important. You've got to do all that, but you've also got to take on those that say, leave it as it is. Yeah, Because absolutely. you will all, particularly in, the, in public services. But here's the thing that, you know, I found most difficult, I think you, you, you find difficult as well. And that is the tendency on the progressive side of politics to define radicals simply by the amount of money you're prepared to commit. Yeah, and this is a big mistake. So I ran a public service for five years, the Crown Prosecution Service. I don't need persuading that if you put a bit of money in the top, you get a better outcome. But I absolutely know to get a much better outcome, you've got to reform. You've got to take the difficult decisions. And people will say, no, no, it's pretty good. Don't rock the boat. Don't change anything. It all works as it is. But you've got to reform. And um, an example from when I was running the Crown Prosecution Service, the first thing I did was to go around the country to all of our offices to try and learn what our staff were doing on the ground. And I remember I was, it was a sort of freezing cold January day, and I was in South Wales. And we're in the office, and this van pulled up. And then it into which were loaded lots and lots of papers. And then it set off over the mountain to the Crown Court for the next day. And when it was en route, one of the cases got switched to a different uh, court, a sort of reverse and go in a different direction. And I said, what is this? And they said, oh, all our files are paper files. I said, well, you must be able to surely move this electronically. No, no, no. We've always done it this way. And so we've got the, it's... We've got to make use of the technology, we've got to win the argument, but we've also got to win people over to the idea that this is what is necessary. Right, that science and technology will be critical to the future. So, Keir, we have only a short time left. You know, the, the Labour leader is always in receipt of a, an inexhaustible supply of advice on how to lose an election. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... <laughs> The thing, the thing that's most difficult, I always think when you're, because you're, you're, you're people, the difference, the difference is sort of, you know, when you're in the Conservative Party, you kind of think, right, it's your divine right to govern, so it's, you know, you just get on with it, yeah. okay? I mean, I think they're a bit different now, but, um, <laughs> but with the Labour Party, you know, the people want, they want this sense of enthusiasm, they, they, they want to be enthusiastic about what they, they, they're going to do. I mean, when you look back, the other difference between us is that I was lucky enough to have Neil Kinnock and John Smith before me. You know, you, you, you weren't, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, put it like that. 
So, <laughs> I just want in the last bit, because people should acknowledge what you have done since 2019. Because I tell you, it was not easy. <laughs> In the closing minute, like, how? How well, is it done? Uh, I'll just pick you up on your interest. I mean, we're trying to do Kinnock, Smith and Blair in one run and to do it in five years. And that is, has meant we've had to go at pace. And it meant we've had to be really ruthless and tough. We couldn't, you know, along the way, when we've got to difficult decisions, people have said to me, don't do it this year, Kit. Leave it. We'll do it at conference next year. And we've had to go at this at pace because we haven't got the time um, to waste on this. And every day I remind myself that to get from where we landed in 2019 to a one-seat Labour majority, a one-seat Labour majority is going to take a bigger swing than 1997. And if that doesn't sober, I often talk about politics as a sort of sharp intake of breath. That gives me a sharp intake of breath every time I say it because people are inhaling the polls. Um, and that is a big, big, big mistake. But there are then just fundamental... So we had to, the first thing we had to do was change the party. And I don't know whether this is because I came into politics later in life, etc. but when you lose that badly, I strongly believe you don't look at the electorate and say, what on earth were you doing? Didn't you listen to us? Should we shout a bit louder? <laughs> you look in the mirror and say, uh, we got this wrong. We've got to change as a party. And we had to change as a party at speed. I also felt strongly that we didn't really have the right to say how we'd run the country until we'd done the change. People were not going to listen to the Labour Party until we showed we had changed and changed for a good purpose. The second bit was then, and we had to be really unrelenting on that, really clear, difficult decisions, um, and, you know, and, and change is never finished. Um, but we got as far as then the next stage, which is to expose the government as not fit to govern. Now, we've been ably assisted in that, I have to admit, um, by the last three prime ministers. And now we get to that place of, well, if not them, then why you? But that's, this is where, you know, because all along the way I've had the advice, you know, when we're at the stage of we've got to change the party, the people yelling from the sidelines saying, where's your vision? Go bolder, go bigger. And I said, we've got to fix the party first. We've got to change the party first. So there will be people all along the journey telling you to do it in a different order, but we had to do it um, in that order. But now we get the chance to lay out the change that an incoming Labour government would put. But if we hadn't changed the party, it would be as naught, because... I strongly think that the electorate don't usually look to change the government if they're pretty happy with it, if things are all right. But when they think it's not all right, actually, I've had enough of you lot, I want some change, and I think we're at that moment, then there's a laser focus in, well, what's the alternative then? And if we hadn't changed the Labour Party, then they'd be looking at us and saying, nah, we're not going to do that. So we've, that's why the next stage is where we've got to be even tougher, even more focused, even more disciplined. And I've said to the Shadow Cabinet and others, to get this over the line at the next general election, we've got to be exceptional um, over the period that we've got left between now and that general election. Well, you know, if, uh, how far you've taken the Labour Party in the last... Uh, Four years as any guide to how far you can take the country will be in good hands. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>